Father God, we love you, we praise you, we glorify in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's alive, that it's active, that it's sharp, and double its swords. God, we pray today that you'd use this word to change us, challenge us, and convict us. Father, we pray today as we are outdoors here, Lord, that you would minimize the distractions. God, that this would be a, a refreshing time for us, that we can uh, hear directly from your word, that we'd be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19 this morning, it says, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of the disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there's not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who has come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions, saying, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. It's a uh, uh, it's an interesting scripture, is it not? Um, there, there's a lot to unpack in that scripture, and so we're we're just we're uh, whenever we go through portions of the Bible, I, I can't talk about every last thing that goes on in there because literally you could preach one sermon 10 different ways uh we're just going to preach it one way this morning so if there's things that haven't been touched upon then we're gonna uh, uh just kind of we're, i'm not avoiding those i just don't have time to go into all of it so we're just gonna pull a few out of it so as as, as you go into the beginning of this uh scripture it's very clear that Jesus is being misunderstood in who he is and what he came to do. And I don't know about you, have you ever been misunderstood by somebody? Yeah, has somebody ever misconstrued what you said or thought you were somebody that you weren't? I, for one, can say that that happens to me often. Uh, it's happened to me often as a pastor, specifically in this church, that people thought I was somebody else and that I was doing something else. Uh, and it's probably happened to you in your relationships as well. Uh, a lot of times if you're married or you have a friendship, People will misconstrue what you say all the time. You have to go back and you have to explain yourself and say, you misunderstood who I am. Let me remind you who I am so that this won't hurt our relationship. Um, and I think that's kind of the largest theme over this uh, message today, but we're going to pull out some things. The first thing I want to pull out of this uh, scripture is that waiting for Jesus does not change who he is. Now, you may not know this, or you may not remember this. I, I always have to teach some because there's people in the room that are, that are, we're not in the room. There's people that are here that uh, maybe don't know the story. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He came before Jesus to announce the arrival of Jesus. And for those of you that remember Sunday school, he came with a, a, a coat of camel's hair and he came eating locusts and, and that's how he came. And so he came to announce Jesus as the forerunner of Christ. And this was prophesied in Malachi chapter 3. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, and whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, saying, the Lord of hosts. And so John was that person that came and announced the arrival of Jesus. And so what happened, though, is that John the Baptist, the Bible indicates that John was placed in prison after he came to announce the arrival of Jesus. Matthew 14, and we'll get there later on. But it says that uh, uh, John the Baptist was placed in prison by Herod Antipas as a result of John condemning Herod for having divorced his wife and then married Herodias. And, and so because of this, John called him out and said, uh, you're wrong and you're in sin. And so what did they do? They put him in prison because of it. 
And so you, you get this idea that John, as a, as a person that goes out as a messenger announced the arrival of Jesus, he, he boldly goes and proclaims this, and then he starts to call out people's sin, and then he gets put in prison. And so he's sitting in prison, he's wondering, I thought this Jesus came as a deliverer. I thought this Jesus came to set people free. And so uh, in, in this scripture, uh, the guy who said, prepare the way of the Lord, is, and then called people to repent, finds himself in prison. And then two of his disciples come to him, and he says, will you go to Jesus? And this is what I want you to ask him. Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Think about it. Jesus came on, uh, on the scene, but before that, John was the one that said, Jesus is coming. This, And he even said, behold the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. He said this when he saw Jesus. He gets put in prison, and then after being in prison, his mind starts to change, and he goes to his disciples, and he says, go and ask Jesus, are you the coming one, or do we look for someone else? He knows that God has sent a deliverer, but he finds himself in prison. He says, you know what? I thought this Messiah was supposed to be a deliverer, but it doesn't seem like he's delivering me. Here's the truth. When you have hope in something that you don't see happening, it can easily turn into despair. It can wreck your heart and, and you think things that aren't true and you create narratives in your head that, that aren't uh, connected with reality because you're isolated from everybody else. And you get this idea in your mind you're like, well, maybe Jesus isn't who he said he was. Maybe, maybe we should start looking for somebody else. I mean, Jeremiah himself, he, he complained that he thought God had deceived him. Jeremiah 20, verse 7, he says, Oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded you are stronger than I, and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Even the best Bible characters lost hope at times. And said, Man, God, are you really who you said you were? And I will tell you, I believe that it's human to do this. John is in prison, and he's wondering, Are, are you the guy? Are you the one? Because I thought deliverance wouldn't look like me being in prison. I thought deliverance would look like me not being in pain. I thought deliverance meant that I wasn't going to have to go through anything, and I did what you called me to do, but now I find myself in a prison. Are, 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 are you the one, or should we be looking for somebody else? I mean, he had to know Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in heaven, salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. He knows this, but he finds himself in prison. Now, when we say prison, a lot of times uh, in today's culture, we talk about prison. You think, oh, well, you know, he's getting three hot meals a day, and he's got cable television. He's hanging out. He's out playing basketball during yard time. Friends, Prison during this period of time was some of the most disgusting conditions that you ever could have think of. Think of. It was dark. It was dirty. It was nasty. It was filled with sewage. These people, they intermingled men and women, and so there was assaults that happened. People weren't given food. Their family members had to be the ones to bring them food. They actually used punishment as, de as a deterrent to crime back then. <laughs> so don't picture him in some cell by himself, laying on a mat, thumbing through his... Uh, you know, pocket New Testament wondering. He's in a disgusting, despicable place. He's lost hope because he, he's lost even the creature comforts of life. And he says, are you the one? The, the, this prison, they called it a fate worse than death. The prisons back then, people wish they would have died than rather go to prison. And, and John finds, finds himself in this place. And he contemplates denying Christ. Matthew Henry said this, he said, The remaining unbelief of good men may sometimes, in an hour of temptation, call into question the most important truth. What do you do when you see the Jesus you expected isn't the Jesus you see? What do you, what do, you do with that? And if we were honest, many of us can identify with that prison experience of John. Being in a place in our lives where we're, we're looking at the circumstance around us and we say, man, what, where is this Jesus? Where is this deliverer? Where is this healer? Where is this one, this magnificent one that I've heard preached and this magnificent one that, I, that I've seen people talk about in the songs and the stories and everything else, but I don't see him. I'm in prison. It 
it's dark and it's smelly and everybody's abandoned me and I feel like I'm alone and I feel like I'm never going to get out of this place and nobody cares. Is he the one or should should I be looking for somebody different? Come on now. We're locked up, sitting in some sort of prison, questioning our faith. Is he the one or should we be looking for some other deliverer? Because when you're waiting, you think and feel like God is never going to show up. I get it, man. Paul probably felt that way when he was beaten and whipped in prison. But this is what I'm going to tell you this morning. You don't get to give up. And you are not going to give up. Some of, some of y'all are sitting here this morning and this word is resonating deeply in your hearts because you identify with that emotional, spiritual prison. You've been calling out to God and I'm telling you right now, prophetically, in the name of Jesus, you are not going to quit. You are not going to give up. Why? Because the Bible says in Philippians, being confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just because you haven't seen the deliverance, just because you haven't seen what you thought you were going to see, Jesus will eventually show up and he's going to deliver you from that prison. You're going to raise your hands in praise and you're going to say, my God is a deliverer. My God is a king. He is the one that sets free. Amen. And then I want to tell you this morning not to look at your circumstance. Don't look at that prison. Look at God. Look at what he can do. I will also tell you it's normal to feel that way. I'm just admonishing you today in the name of Jesus to not give up. The Bible speaks to this. It says in Galatians, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I know many of people that lost out on the reaping because they gave up. They, they left the field before the crop came to fruition. They stopped watering because they thought it wasn't going to grow. They pulled it out by the roots and said, this thing uh, has lost it. We no longer need to do it. Isaiah 40 verse 30 says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You've got to remind yourself of what God has done. Amen. You, you, you have to do this. And John's in prison. He's questioning his faith. He sends these two disciples to see Jesus. And I love this, man. I, I don't know why, but when I, maybe it's just because I'm sarcastic. But I always picture Jesus with a little bit of a sarcastic. Jesus was funny, man. Yes. Don't, don't think that Jesus wasn't funny. When he says, a camel going through an eye of a needle, that's funny. <laughs> And so I picture Jesus. He's hanging out. These two disciples come up. And so, so Jesus says this to these two disciples. He goes, why don't you do this? Why don't you go and tell John the things which you hear and say? Why don't you go and tell John that? The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to him. Go and tell John that. And then let, ask him whether or not I'm the one. Ask him whether or not he should go looking for anybody else. He might be in prison not seeing what's going on, but why don't you remind him of what's going on outside of his prison? Basically, what I've been saying and doing should be proof enough that I am who I said that I am. I mean, at, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he had already turned water into wine. He had healed an official's son. He had drived out, uh, drove out evil spirits. He had healed Peter's mother-in-law. He had healed many that were sick and oppressed. He had the miraculous catch of fish. He cleansed the man with leprosy. He, he healed a centurion's paralyzed servant. He healed a paralytic who was let down from the roof. He healed a, a, a withered man's hand on the Sabbath. He raised a widow's son from the dead. He calmed the, he calmed the storm. He, he had already cast the demons into the pigs. He had done a ton of stuff at this point, not even getting to the second half of all of his miracles after this. He'd done a lot. He hadn't just merely said like, hey, I'm the one. And so Jesus tells these guys, hey, go and tell them that. Go and tell them how many miracles. Go tell them how many people have heard the gospel. 
Tell me how many people have been healed. Tell me how many people have been delivered. Go and tell him because here's what Jesus knew. His resume spoke for itself. He didn't need commentary or defense. He didn't need to explain it to him again. He was like, you know what, man? I've got more than enough that I've done. And, and, I, and, I, and I, 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 I always wonder what it's going to be like to have the kind of questions that we're going to be able to ask God. I, in, my, in my view, I hope there's a computer screen that you can sit down with and ask it any questions. You get to see the video of it. I don't know why. I, I want to know what those people are saying about me in junior high at the other table at the lunchroom. But I, but I also want to know, like, what was it like when the guys came back to John? Was John like, oh, okay, okay. I, uh, I appreciate you letting me know that. I, I didn't know all of that. It's changed the way that I, I view what's going on. Now, now I, I think that would be an expected response. He'd been in prison. He's in a dark hole. It's understandable that he didn't know what was going on. But I, I, I'm hoping that John had some sort of emotion about it. I'm hoping that John's heart was changed in that moment where he was like, you know what, man? I'm sorry I missed that. I'm sorry that I missed that because I, I, I've just been in prison. I didn't know that. I mean, th this is what was promised in Isaiah 35. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped and the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. These are promises of Scripture. Think, think about this. This time in the Bible, they call it the, the, the dark years between Malachi and Matthew. There were 700 years where God didn't speak. 700 years. And, and you imagine those times and those years were generation after generation, and they never saw the Spirit move, and they never heard God speak. I guarantee you many people fell away from serving Yahweh. We, we find ourselves in, the, in, in this season where it seems like everything's changing around us. It seems like the world is, is, is not going to be how it was to us previously. And some of us lose heart and we say, man, what is the future going to look like? He's coming on the clouds. King's kingdom will bow down. We can't lose heart, man. We can't lose heart. Just because we don't see the deliverance today doesn't mean the deliverance isn't coming. Yeah. We, we can't lose heart and forget what God has done. John was reminded. He got back on track. He stopped second guessing. And, and so I ask you this morning, do you need to be reminded? Yeah. Do, you, do you need to remind yourself of what God has done? And I, and I get it. When we get into a rough patch, when we live in the prison of our own mind, we, we start to think in our own minds, man, is Jesus really who he said that he is? Now, if you're anything like me, a lot of times when I go through those doubting periods, whether they be for weeks or months or years, I always look back on it years later and I see that God moved during that season. I just couldn't understand it. I, I couldn't see the fingerprints of God on it. I, I thought because it wasn't happening the way that I wanted it to happen, that it wasn't God moving, but God was actually moving I just what didn't have the spiritual discernment to understand it. I want you to say this this morning in your heart. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Hasn't God done great things for you in your life? Even, even if you're in a, a, a different season right now, can you testify that God has done great things in Amen. your life? Amen. Didn't he save you? Yeah. Didn't he redeem you? Yeah. Hasn't he hasn't he placed you in a body of believers? Yeah. Hasn't he given you friends? Hasn't yeah. some of y'all need to be reminded that he he gave you that spouse that you prayed for. Yeah. And now you've forgotten to love that person that God has sent you. You're not thankful for them anymore. You, your kids are doing well. You have a job. You got a car that runs. But you've gotten yourself into this place where you're thinking about what he hasn't done instead of thinking about what he has done. You're putting God to a test and saying, God, I used to love you. I used to serve you. I used to follow you based on what you did in this season. But right now I find myself in a prison and I'm not going to do that anymore until you do this. Don't worry about what he hasn't done. Remind yourself of what he has done. God is faithful. He is powerful. He is mighty. He is a healer. He is a provider. He is a lover. He is. I remember when I was back in college, and many Friday nights, I spent my dorm room worshiping alone. 
Because I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. I didn't want to do it, man. I, I literally, in college, I would sit at my desk, and I would draw, and I would play worship music. I would just worship God. Many a nights, I would take my little book, and I would find somewhere on campus with a piano, and I would just go down there and worship for a couple hours. I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. I didn't. I mean, I went to a Christian college, <laughs> but they were doing things that I didn't want to take part of. A lot of times in that period, I lost heart because I thought, you know, it seems like I'm giving up this temporary pleasure for something that I just haven't seen. Everybody else seems to be having fun. and People seem to be doing things that the Bible probably wouldn't approve of. And God was my best friend. And before I thought it was weird that I hold away in my room or I went around on a Friday or Saturday night and worship by myself in some nondescript room. But what I've seen over the last couple decades is that God has brought me more than I ever could have imagined for the sacrifice of that season. He just has. I can testify that God has given me a, a great wife and a great life and great kids and all y'all and I mean, psh, forget about it, man. The life that we live together at FBC is better than any college experience, yeah. man. Right. Amen. We live the best life around these parts. You know what I'm saying? But in that season, it feels like I'm missing out on everything that everybody else seems to be able to do. Here's what you do when you're losing heart. you got to praise God, man. If you feel like not praising God, that is the most important time that you need to praise God. If you wake up on a Sunday morning and you say, you know, man, I don't want to go to church this morning. You better go to church. Because when you start to praise his name, it does something inside of your spirit. When you sing these songs and you're reminded of a, of a God that saves and a God that delivers you, you are reminded and say, you know what, I might be in a season where I'm not seeing that deliverance, but I know that God is going to show up. You, you got to come to worship, and then you just continue to worship until you're reminded. You, you've got to read your word, and then you've got to be convinced. You, you read old Bible stories of, of waiting where, where Joseph's kidnapped, and he's in Egypt, and he doesn't know what's going to happen, and you see his deliverance. You're like, man, if God can do that for Joseph, he can do that for me. You read Bible stories of God's deliverance, and then you're convinced Romans 4.21, and being fully convinced that he had promised that he was able to perform. you got to read about deliverance to remember deliverance. Amen? Amen? Then you can live out Psalm 126, that our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. And they said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. One of the, one of the greatest things that we get with being in community with one another is that those of us that lose heart are surrounded by people that may not be in that season. And so when you're honest with a brother or sister, you say, man, I'm just not in a good season. I've lost heart. That brother or sister will put their arm around you and say, you know what, brother? I was in that season before. And I want to testify what God did for me, and I want to testify that God will do it for you. And you're not going to lose heart. And I'm going to remind you of all the great things that God has done in your life. You are just going to stick with it. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I has not seen nor heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Let me prophesy this to you today. And I mean it when I say it. The best things of your life haven't happened yet. Your best days are not behind you. I, I don't want you looking behind and saying, man, it sure was good here. It sure was good there. I really believe that we are about to enter into some of the best years that we have ever seen in our lives. I think we're going to have so much joy. I think we're going to have so much peace. I think we're going to have so much provision. We're going to see God move in such miraculous ways that we've never seen him move before. It is a great time to be alive. Oh, man, it's a great time to be alive because the remnant of God is going to see God move in such mighty ways. The world around us is going to crumble. They're going, to, they're going to fall into despair, worry, and doubt. We're going to stand firm in the house of our God, and we're going to flourish. We're going to see Him do great things. We need to remind ourselves that this is our God. Amen? In the Scripture, Jesus uh, is speaking, and, and I want to uh, draw you back to the Scripture in, in Matthew 11, uh, 11. And he says this, and Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there's not been risen one greater than John the Baptist. 
And so, uh, excuse me, but he who is, uh, I just want to preach about that part, but we're not. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of, viol- uh, kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in our understanding in day and age about violence, it's hard to understand because we we only understand the word violent in a in a bloody, bludgeoning sense of violence. But that's not really the sense that Jesus is talking about violence. You can you can violently shut a door. You you can violently uh, uh, say something. You can violently chop down a tree like you can do things violently that aren't actual violence towards another person um and so i want you to understand this violent thing in in a sense of jesus is saying there has been a force that has come against the kingdom of heaven that has been violent in the sense that it is doing everything it can to destroy what god is trying to do these spirits and these people are doing everything they can with violence and it's not sticks and stones and swords it's it's a violent action uh, of, of an attacking against the kingdom of god and so jesus conversely says if if the violence is coming against the kingdom of god then if we're going to take the kingdom the violent are going to take it by force they, they have to do it with force uh, uh, one commentator said this the, the greek noun is without the article men who are violent use force the meaning is determined by the preceding clause. The violent are men of eager, impetuous zeal who grasp the kingdom of heaven. It's peace, it's pardon, it's blessedness with as much eagerness as men who would snatch and carry off their own spoil of a conquered city. It, it is new life in the prophet's language given them as a prey. And so it's this idea that if, if we were not, if we were not Christians and we were going to lay siege to a city and go in and take over that city and take the spoils of that city, what would it look like to go and take out, take over a city? Would we, would we walk into this city and be like, so we're here to take this thing over. Um, we're asking you folk to bring out your value goods and lay them in the street so that we may collect them. If you're not willing to, we're going to strongly encourage you to do this. No, man. No, nobody would do that. The, the, the example is of a riotous people and how they act. The example is how a, a, a riotous group of people are overcome with the ideas that they have in their mind and they're going to accomplish it by force. This isn't a hard word picture to see. Do, do you guys not remember last summer? Do you, do you not remember the, the, the riots that happened in most large American cities? Do you, do you not remember the marching and the flames and the, 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 the interactions with the police department and the, uh, all these other things? That, do, you, do you not know what a riot looks like? When, when a riot happens, people go through and they break windows and they don't give up and they stay up late and they, they, they continue to scream and chant until they get their demands. They're willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want. Christians, I mean, we can barely get the people that are saved to show up to a church service. Can I just watch online? That's not saying anything. It's nothing against y'all because y'all are here. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Another commentator said it this way. The spirits of men are so excited and animated by a desire after this kingdom that as if it, as it were, attacked like a besieged city, men of all sorts pressing to get into it with a violence like that of men who are taking a place by storm. This is what Jesus is saying in this. If you want to see the kingdom of God, it's going to take a violent act. It's going to take more than just sitting around and talking about it. It's going to take more than a Facebook post. It's going to take more than morning Bible reading. If you want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to have a forceful, violent pushing, attacking, yes. by whatever need yes. means necessary, yes. we're going to do it. Yes. The law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. 
At what level of violence are you willing to take hold of the kingdom of God? How drastic. See, some people will give up something right away. Stop doing something right away. I'll give you an example. There's a gentleman that's here this morning, and I, and I don't want to call him out because I didn't ask him if I could. But but a couple of weeks ago, I was preaching in service about making God a priority. And, and, and he came up to me after service and he said, Pastor, I had something in my life that was keeping me from church on Sunday. I, right after service, I called those people and I said, don't expect me again. I need to be in the house of God. Amen. He said, I was convicted so much by the sermon today that I didn't want to leave the church without calling those people and said, what I've been doing with you on Sunday is not as important as what I'm doing here on Sunday. And bless God, he's still here this morning. I'm unbelievably proud of him. That's violence. That's violence. That's what violence looks like. It's like, you know what, I'm doing something drastic. I'm not going to live the life that everybody else is leading. I want, I want the kingdom of God in my life. I want to see Jesus move in my life. I need it because of my wife and because of my kids. I need it more than anything else. And whatever this violence looks like, I'm willing to do it because I want to see the kingdom of God. I have to constantly remind you of this, but friend, you are secure in your salvation. And, and for some reason, people misconstrue when I when I get all fired up that, that when I'm talking about sin, that that one sin is going to lead you into destruction. Now, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to leave the service today and say, well, pastor said one sin isn't going to leave us uh, in destruction. So let's go do it, man. Let's go make it happen on this Sunday afternoon. But this is this is why I talk about sin as much as I do is because. I sin on average probably every day. I really do. Now I will tell you as as your pastor, if I tell you that I sin every single day, the sins that I commit daily are not actionable sins. What happens in the sins that I live in my life are typically sins that start in my mind. A thought will come in that is a despicable, disgusting thought that is something that the devil would love for me to take action on. But here's what I know about human nature, is that the seed of action of sin always starts in the mind. And so when I preach against sin, it's not because I think that if you do something today that you'll lose your salvation before sundown. What I know about myself and human nature is that if it starts with a thought and it turns into an action, it can quickly turn into a lifestyle that will quickly quickly lead you away from Christ. And so for myself, I would much oft be reminded of the fact of the debilitating effects from sin so that when those thoughts come into my mind, I can take drastic measures to remove those things from my mind so they would not turn into an action that would bring even more guilt and shame, that they would not turn into a lifestyle that would become an addiction, that I would find myself in a place that I no longer trust God and no longer believe God. I would much rather have a violent action at the beginning of it to say, I'm not going to allow this thing to control me because I want to see the kingdom of God in my life. I believe the scripture of Luke 13 to strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able. Man, I want to live in the narrow gate. I believe that wide is the path that leads to destruction. And it's not because I think I'm going to lose my salvation. It's because I so deeply love Jesus that I want to please him with my whole life. I don't want anything to come between he and I. And so whenever it comes in, I'm going to be violent with it. I'm going to say, you know what, man? If I've got to see the kingdom of God by violence, I'm going to take it by force. I'm not going to sit around and say, you know what, man? I would have done something, but nobody came around and called me out on it. You know, I made it seem like something was going on in my life, but nobody else cared enough. So I'm going to use that as an excuse to fall into sin. It, it's, it's like this. I, I've been married to my wife for 23 years. And I still over-communicate with her. I don't take her for granted. I still invest in our relationship. She ain't going to leave me, ever. I'll kill you. (laughs) 
I'm the same way with my kids. Yep. I hug them, I kiss them, I encourage them all the time. And, and I know if I went a week without hugging or kissing my kids, they wouldn't say, Dad, I'm moving out of the house. I know if I went a week without hugging or kissing my wife, she wouldn't say I want a divorce. I know that. But I still pursue them with a sense of eagerness because I love them so much. There's a sermon in there somewhere. Yeah. I, I don't pursue Jesus because I think that I lost my salvation on the drive to church. I'm just so thankful for what he's done in my life, man. John 6, 27 says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And I will tell you this, and I'm not good at much else, but I really want to be a good Christian. I don't want to be a good Christian because of a boast, and I don't want to be a good Christian to please the people around me. I just want to live a life that's honoring and pleasing to God, because I believe that he is worth it. Amen. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what it says. Last point I'm going to make is this. Just a few more minutes. At the end of this, in verses 16 through 19, it says, but to what shall I liken this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking. They say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. They said, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by your children. Now, we're running out of time, but I want to quickly explain this to you. Is that the end of this scripture... Uh, Jesus is using this example of children and how children in that time apparently would mock what the traditions of the time were. And so uh, at, a, at a, a, a celebration, people would play flutes and dancing, and the expectation would people would dance. And then they would play another type of music, and the expectation would be that people would mourn. And so kids being kids, kids mock what they see, right? And so if they see adults doing it, they do it. And so Jesus uses his example to the people that are around him, and he says, you know what? You guys are basically like a bunch of children. It, here's what children do, is that they play the songs of a, of a celebration, and they expect people to dance when there's really no celebration. They, they play songs expecting people to mourn when there's really nothing to mourn over. And, and then you guys do this to me and expect me to be who you want me to be instead of who I am. And he uses this example and he says, look at, look at John. John came as a Nazarite wearing bad clothes and, and, and only eating locusts and honey. This guy living in Nazarite. And, and you look at him and you say, he, he had a demon. That's what you said about him. So now here I am living amongst you like one of you not being like John, I'm not wearing camel hair and I'm not eating locusts. I'm living the same way that you guys live. I eat what you eat and I drink what you drink and I go where you go. And so now you turn on me and you say, this guy's a glutton because he eats. This guy's a wine bibber. This guy hangs out with sinners. I, I can't please you people. I can't please you. You, you want me to come down and, and be a friend to you and that I'm a friend to you and you say that I'm a, I'm a glutton, a wine bibber and a friend of sinners. John separates himself from everybody. You say that he has a demon. You guys like a bunch of kids. A bunch of kids playing the flute game, expecting that I'm going to be what you want me. John wasn't good enough for you. I, he called you to repentance. You said that he had a demon. He was so restrained, he only ate honey and locusts. There's no pleasing you. Henry said this, Christ who is undefiled and separate from sinners is here represented as in a league with them and polluted by them. The most unspotted innocence will not always be a defense against reproach. Did you hear that? The most unspotted innocence will not always be a defense against reproach. And so I'll leave you with that encouragement today. As we, as we attempt to follow Jesus, remember Jesus and the way that he walked and the way that he lived. He lived above reproach and the people around him still called him things. 
they still said he should have been something else. And, and you will experience this as you go out and you live with Jesus. You'll experience this as you go out and you live for the Lord. People are going to come into your life and they're going to call you something that you're not. They're going to expect you to be something that you're not. All because they have an expectation on you what they think a Christian looks like and what a Christian should say and be. Don't worry about them. Take the kingdom by force. Be who Jesus has called you to be. Remind yourself of what God has done. And let Jesus be who he's going to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? If you're here this morning you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to become one. It's really quite easy if you're a Christian or you are not. If you have given your life to Jesus or you haven't. It's really easy. You just turn away from the world and you turn towards Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins and he will forgive you. Be violent this morning. Be drastic. If you've never made that decision before, you want to live new life in Christ, would you raise your hand right now and say, that's me, I want to give my life to Jesus? Is there anybody that needs to make that decision for the very first time? Raise your hand high. Now maybe you're in that camp of like, Pastor, I'm, I know I'm saved, but man, I, whew, I'm far from him. Real far. So Dad, I need a violent action. I need to come back to him with violence. I need to get away from this old life. I want to walk with Jesus again. I, and I don't want some superstition hand in the air. Like today is the drastic day. This is the day that I'm going to make a big change. I'm going back to Jesus. If you need to make that decision today to rededicate your life, I want you to raise your hand this morning. See, that's me. Everybody needs to make that decision. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Violent. Father, thank you for this word, Lord. I pray that it would resonate deep down into our spirits. Father, we wouldn't forget what you've done for us. Father, we would take the kingdom of God seriously. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.